Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Heroes Foundation's first online league leading event. Now, at Heroes, we connect our nation's youth with leaders and role models to provide positive and experienced guidance for dealing with life's issues and the challenges. And we're very excited that for our first live event, that we are lucky to have a legend of energy and a champion of energy mm -hmm. here with us today. Now, a legend of energy is someone who has contributed to the growth and the development of the energy sector, which we all know significantly benefits Trinidad and Tobago today. A champion of energy is an industry leader committed to the development of the next generation of energy professionals and leaders in Trinidad and Tobago. Arlene Chow is the CEO of Heritage Petroleum Company Limited. Prior to this appointment, Arlene held the position of Chief Operating Officer at Atlantic LNG Company. Arlene has held leadership operations in oil and gas operations of, 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 over the course of four decades. Now she started her career in Petrotrin as a geologist in Pinal. Now you would not find Sean Rampasad in an office. Apparently you can meet him on the patio deck working on his laptop under the sun, the trees, and the cool breeze. Now, ironically, Sean's open door policy has been turned into simply an open policy since there's no door standing between you and him. Now, as the CEO of Rams Logistics, Sean focuses on building the leaders of tomorrow by motivating and connecting with millennials. Now, he facilitates the growth of his team by providing opportunities for them to shine. Now, also with us today is a very special 14-year-old by the name of Tristan. Tristan attends Trinity College Mocha, and he's a technology enthusiast. He is really excited about Trinidad and Tobago's energy future, and I am very happy to hand over to him to lead in today's discussion. So, Tristan, it's over to you. Okay. So, then. Okay, so good afternoon all. So as I was previously introduced, I am Tristan and it's a pleasure and honor to meet both Ms. Arlene and Sean. Now, the first question that I'd like to start off this session with to both of them is, so I know that you are both very involved in energy and I've heard some things about you, but what do you do? Can you explain that to everyone here? What exactly is your job in the energy sector and why is it important to our society, to the economy and the people of our country? Perhaps I will start. Um, good morning. Good evening. I am Arlene Chow, CEO of Heritage. So Heritage Petroleum is a relatively new company, actually. It was formed after uh, uh, Petrotron was closed and we are two years old at this point in time. We have significant subsurface resources, and at present, we produce approximately 40,000 barrels of oil per day. Uh, this is really important to Trinidad and Tobago and to the government, as this is approximately 9% of our total gross domestic product. So very significant as well. A 60% of the oil of the oil production comes from heritage. So it is very important. I know that we want to diversify the economy, but as the Minister of Energy said, for a while, energy and, and oil and petrochemicals will be the mainstay of our economy for several years from now. So heritage is going to be a really important part of producing the oil in place in Trinidad for the next uh, quite a long time, next few years. That's what I, that is why it's important. What I am is the CEO and um, it's really simple. I try to ensure that I efficiently manage the resources of the company and make sure that my people are safe because we are a high hazard industry. I'm responsible for all the operations and development and the drilling as well. And also ideas with 
the board of directors and my chairman, and I am the, the face of the company to the Trinidad public. I am very honored to serve as CEO, and I look forward to many successful years in Heritage Petroleum. So that's what I do, Tristan, and that's why Heritage is so important to Trinidad. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us. It was very interesting. I know, um, Mr. Sean, would you yeah, like to thank you. Thank you very much, Tristan, and thank you very much, Aline. So, guys, my name is Sean Rampasad. I'm the CEO of Rams Logistics. Uh, Rams is headquartered in Canupia, Trinidad. Uh, today, we are about 600 people across Trinidad, Guyana, Suriname, Miami, Houston, Mexico. And next month, we are opening our office in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, as a logistics company, essentially what we do is that we ensure that people and equipment are always in the right place at the right time to ensure that our customers' operations keep moving. So in the case of our energy clients, every single day we are moving pipe, uh, pipe equipment, uh, drilling equipment, uh, finished product from anywhere in the world, both into Trinidad and then offshore to the rigs and the platforms operating offshore, as well as taking product from those operations and sending them back out to the rest of the world. And we actively do that in Trinidad, Guyana, Suriname and, and Mexico. And uh, we have support offices in the US. Uh, our office in Houston is really there to, to support the rest of our offices because as, as, as some of you will know, Houston is the global head of energy, uh, the global hub of energy, and a lot of those energy decisions are made in Houston. Uh, my job as CEO, uh, very similar to Aline, I report to the board of directors, but more than anything else, my job is to look for opportunities for the company to ensure that we could use the resources that are available to us, both human, financial, and otherwise, to ensure that we deliver a return to our shareholders. And we do that being very cognizant of the fact that we operate in an environment that we have a responsibility to the people and to the communities in which we operate. Uh, I hope some of you all are following us on social media. And if you are not, please join, uh, follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. We have almost 200,000 followers on, on Facebook. And we share a lot of great information on the energy sector. And not just sharing information on the energy sector, but sharing information on how all of us, young people, not so young people, can all make a difference when it comes to energy and also improving the lives uh, of the communities in which we operate. So, Tristan, thank you very much for having us, having me here this afternoon. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, Mr. Sean, as well. That was pretty cool. <laughs> so, um, let me continue with my next question. Um, so. As I am a teenager now wanting to pursue technology and somewhat energy as well, I'd like to know how to how you got to where you are in the energy sector today, from when you were about my age or even younger. What did you do or what helped or motivated you to work to where, to where you are now? Mr. Sean? Yep, all right. So Tristan, you know, uh, my dad started this company in 1985. And, uh, you know, from the time I was about 11, just after I, I, I was lucky enough to, to, to attend presentation college in Chaguanas, uh, every summer I would go to, go to work with my dad. Uh, my dad was, a, a, my dad is a customs broker. And so he started off the company as a customs broker. Back then, uh, you know, he probably had like five or six people working with him. And every summer, that's what I would, I would do. I would work in my dad's business. Uh, when I when I went off to university, I uh, I started a, a, a number of other small businesses. Uh, today, I I also uh, own uh, the ranch in in Trinity Mall and in in C Tree. So if you have in that area, check out those businesses as well. But uh, I, I I I'm really passionate about entrepreneurship and businesses and starting businesses. And uh, I've always been very fortunate to have good support from my parents from my family and uh, I joined my dad's business in about 2003 and uh, when I joined the business in 2003 uh, I knew that I wanted to grow it into something bigger than it was right now and I was very lucky to have his support and the support of this team working there to continue growing the business to make it into what it is today. That's great that you had that much support. Uh, um, I'd also like to have my own company one day. <laughs> very good and I'm, I'm sure you I'm sure you will. You know, I, I always tell people, you know, the first business I did, I always remember it. Uh, I worked for my dad for, for, for a summer 
but uh, I had an older cousin and I was about, I think about your age, Tristan, 13 or 14. Uh, and I remember the, the most amount, of, the, the richest I ever felt in my life was one summer when I was about your age uh, and my cousin and I decided to go to the Shagawanas market and uh, we would buy Bodhi in, in those big feed bags. You'll buy, we'd buy wholesale, come back home, make it into small bundles with, with rubber bands and walk around our whole village and walk around the whole of Canopia selling it. And that, the markup was like 300%, right? So if I was selling a bundle of booty for $10, we were paying something like $3 and something cents for it. So, you, you know, I think a lot of times people confuse starting off business, but the, the key is to start doing something. And there are so many things that are available in 2020, especially with the advent of the internet, right? You don't have to go to the Shogunas market and buy and, sell, and walk around your village and sell anymore. You can sell online. You can do so many cool things online. And that's where entrepreneurship starts. It starts in creating value out of something that's the key to entrepreneurship creating value people pay for value yes yes i'm grateful for online as well because you can start a lot of businesses and sell a lot of things from online not just products but just online services as well so correct that's really cool um miss arlene so i have to say i absolutely admire sean he is such an entrepreneur and it, it takes a special kind of person. I think his mantra is no guts, no glory. Have a <laughs> feeling that's what Sean is about, no guts, no glory. But that's absolutely great. So I have a, a more, I guess, a more traditional story. In a way, I started school in Sandy Grandi in St. Francis RC. And I was one of the few who passed common entrance in those days. And I went to school in St. Joseph Convent, Port of Spain. So I had to travel by taxi every day from San Grande to um, Port of Spain, right at the bottom of Independence Square and walk all the way up to the top of Pembroke Street. And um, I was a master doing homework in a taxi. I was a boss because, you know, you have a whole long drive, so you could just balance and do all your homework. So, you know, you're supposed to be bright in San Grande, right? So when you reach a Port of Spain convent, you're like, oh my God, everybody there brighter than you. Plus all of them went to school together and they had their cliques and I was a little country girl and it was hard. I didn't have any friends in the beginning, you know, but I had to figure out what I wanted. And um, I found a niche in what I could do really well and that was earth sciences. And I did like it a lot and I excelled. But, you know, I didn't know anything about oil and geology because I grew up in Grandy, right? And it was cocoa and coffee and like Sean, Every day after school, I would go by my father's co co um, cocoa store and buy and sell cocoa. I knew how to tell people it have 20% moisture in this, so I ain't giving you so much money, etc. And uh, so when I told my mother I was leaving and going and do earth sciences as a, as a degree after I came out of St. Joseph Convent, she was like, no way, that's a man work. I know she don't want me to do that. She said, go and teach, go and do pharmacy. I don't know if you ever passed Sunny Grandy, right next to the Kentucky. There is a spot there exactly where my mother wanted me to go and be a pharmacist. So when you go in, next time you pass through Eastern Main Road, look at that spot right opposite the market. That was my pharmacy to be. So she didn't want me to go because we come from Grandy. All our roots there. My father had land, estate, etc. So anyway, I decided to go. And um, I went and I did the sciences that I excelled at at um, high school. That was geology and chemistry and stuff. And then um, I was, uh, when I graduated, not in the top of my class, just about second, Krishna Prasad, if a lot of people might know, and I'm sure Sean knows, he is also a real exemplar in our industry. He came to Jamaica and he hired me straight out of university into Trintock at the time. You know, but I'd never been to Penal before in my life because I come from Grandy, okay? So the only time you go to Penal if you go on a church excursion, and I really didn't go on one. So the day before I had to go to work, I had to drive with my sister from Grandy to Penal to find out where Penal was to start working this oil company that my mother didn't want me to go to anyway. So, you know, even from then, you know, um, it hasn't been easy because of, uh, I was first of all, the only woman in my geology class. And then when I got hired into, into uh, Trintock, it was just a few women and it was hard. I remember signing um, my my job when I was signing up for my job and it says that um, men and their wives would get medical. I thought, well, it meant spouse. Actually, no, it meant wives. So in those days, even if you got married, you weren't entitled to medical in Trintock. You all believe that? 
So, you know, we had, as a few women that there, we had to go to the union and we had to fight it. And in the end, they did change it and your, and your um, husbands could actually get medical. So we started at the base and it was rough because women weren't accepted at that time. I remember we only had radios. I thought Tristan don't even know what a radio is in the car. We didn't have cell phones, Tristan. We had a radio. And if the women talk on the radio, as soon as they spoke, some man would come on and say some horrible thing to us, honestly. And actually, it was a man who used to defend us. And recently, I just met him again. And he used to say, if you're a man, show yourself, say who you are. But we had a rough time as women, really and truly, going through the oil industry in those days. It was hard. But, you know, I persevered and I, I decided at one point in time that I wanted to do something more. And again, it's a bit of why I'm right now in Heritage because Petrogen gave me a scholarship and I did my master's in engineering after that. And I actually also went and did, um, so I came back and I went and I did a diploma in computer science. See Tristan, I could program a little bit or I used to be able to, I was a boss at SQL. I still could do it, I think a little bit, but must see a little bit rusty. And um, you know, I always say people must be the obvious choice because when BP was looking for somebody to run their IT and mapping and stuff, I was the obvious choice. I got headhunted and I went across to BP. And I didn't like my job at BP at all because I think it was much smaller than the one I had on Petrochem, believe it or not. But I had a boss to give me some advice, which is some advice I would love to give all of you guys. He says, and it's like what Sean is doing, create the job you want, proceed until apprehended. And I did that through my BP career. I created the job I wanted. It was never in the job description and I proceeded until apprehended. It was easier to say sorry than to ask for permission, put it like that. And I moved up every two years and, um, and through the ranks and all the way to, um, all the, way to um, the VP in Port of Spain. And then I went to Alaska as uh, area operations manager. And I came back to London as the chief of staff of the whole of the um, BP production company. And I was the first black woman ever to be a chief of staff. And um, and, uh, and after that, I came over to Atlantic as the chief operating officer. And uh, afterwards, here I am at Heritage after I retired from BP. So, you know, what can I say? I think, you know, what sustained me was what I learned from my mother and father. The whole issue of respect and hard work, integrity, all of those things that I see at the bottom of the heroes thing. I learned it at home. I didn't learn it from any company. I'm sure Sean has values too, but those values for me of hard work, integrity, respect and performance and delivery, I learned at home and that is what I brought to me to the organizations I worked with. And when I retired, I'm here now trying to give back because I did get a lot. I got my scholarship from there and I got my early start from, from Chuntok. Um, but I think, you know, when I look back, it's everything that I have learned in life that is, has me here and the values that I've kept next to me through everything. So that's my story, Tristan, bit different from Sean. Yes. Sounds a lot, a lot more interesting, Arlene. <laughs> yes. Very fascinating, yes. Um, so as you already know, I am on my part of technology, I'm very tech enthusiast. Um, so I would like, and I know that I am going to encounter a lot of challenges along the way, right? So my next question to you is, what was one of your biggest challenges that you faced on your journey to being a part of the energy sector? Um, let's see, Mr. Sean, would you like to go first? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, where should I start? Uh, you know, Tristan, uh, like I say, when I joined my, my dad's business in 2003, it was a very small company, um, you know, not very well known at all. Uh, in Trinidad, we have an energy sector that goes back to almost about 100 years, right? Uh, and you have very well established players and companies who have done very, very well over the last few years uh, working in those industries. So there was a bit of a, uh, the, the barrier to entry into the energy sector is very high as a service company. 
if you don't have that long history behind you, sometimes it's very, very difficult to, to, to really be able to get into the energy sector. Um, and what we did in, in order to really get into the energy sector is that, is that we, we decided to go uh, along two main paths. One was by investing in technology that we thought did not exist that would create value to our customer supply chain and have them reduce their costs. And then uh, on, on the, uh, the second part of it was the whole idea of uh, bundling items and creating value. So back in 2003, you know, a big part of logistics are things like freight forwarding, trucking, customs brokerage, and companies in Trinidad were accustomed using many different service providers for that. So there were many, uh, every time you have to do a transaction as a large company, it costs you money. And we, we, we said to them, listen, you know, we could bundle all of that for you. We could help you to reduce your costs. And then uh, nowadays, you know, like if you go online and buy something on Amazon, you, you expect that you'll be able to track it from the time you place the order until it gets delivered to you, right? Uh, back in the early 2000s, that wasn't a norm. That wasn't something that was everybody expected, but we were one of the first companies in the country to really start to put that end-to-end -end track in place. So our investment in technology is one of the big things that really helped us to penetrate a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, customers in the energy sector. Mm. <laughs> All right, um, Ms. Arlene. Yeah, so um, Sean had his own business. So he actually could set his standards and everything around performance, etc. I joined uh, um, I joined a Anglo American company, white Anglo American company, very male dominated. So um, it was hard. I um, so this is BP. I had to work harder, and I had to prove myself even more than the normal person would have to prove themselves. You know, as a woman, um, I had to say run the entire offshore of Tixaman and Pui. That was 300 men. But, you know, I was described in different ways that you would never describe a man. I was described as too emotional, right? Too tough, which I told me was a compliment. And even uh, not calm enough. You will ever think of Sean not being calm enough or anybody describing Sean like that. So I had to, you know, weather through those things to prove myself day after day after day. You know, when I was young, it used to get me angry, you know, because there was this level of uh, unfairness that you had to deal with. But as I got older, I realized it was a fact of life and I had to figure out how to deal with it. I was lucky in that I had mentors and actually people who believed that I could do it even with all these obstacles and actually were men and they supported me through the whole organization. You know, when I became chief of staff, you know, after a long haul in BP, I think I had 30 women call me to be their mentors. And I looked at my boss and said, I have no more advice to give. I could maybe mentor two people but it was showing, you know, the difficulty with women, both black and white, going through a male Anglo-American company and what they had to face. Um, so, you know, it was not easy. I have no regrets and I have no bad feelings. It has made me tougher and I think that's a compliment. And I know now how to manage in so many different circumstances. So that was my challenge, different from Sean, in a huge corporate environment, being a black woman in a male, white, Anglo-American company. Yes. Just on that one is interesting, eh? <laughs> yes, I, I do agree. Yes, some women do have it up. Huh? But I mean, if you can push past that, then you could show everyone how determined you are. And they'll see your success. So if they said anything negative about you, they'll eat their words. Yeah. Thank you for that. You heard that, Sean? I did, I did, and I I, I agree with it, with uh, with Arlene one hundred percent, and Tristan, you know, I think uh, for, for 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 the for the for the uh, for the benefit of your viewers, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, Arlene talks a lot about being be, being a woman of color in an Anglo American company, and and uh, I don't know, Arlene, maybe you might you, you might be able to say a little bit more about it. How how is that affected by being from a small island like Trinidad? versus coming from Europe or North America. I think yeah. that's one of the things that, that, that I've seen so much that I feel like 
our professionals in Trinidad have it a lot more difficult. Like you feel like you have you 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 have to prove more than anybody else in order to prove your worth. And as a woman of color coming from the Caribbean, it makes it even doubly difficult sometimes. Yeah, I I agree because um, you know I landed in Alaska and uh, they had the biggest men I've ever seen. You know, like they're four hundred pounds and they were huge. I, I was scared out of my wits because here I was going to run a whole infrastructure which is a huge thing. It was uh, 3,000 men on a camp. Um, we had about six camps and we had a ton load of everything. You know, we had to do everything. We managed the camps, we managed the food, we managed the ice roads, we managed everything. And when I first landed, I was damn scared. I was like, oh my God, these 300 very, very big men and how am I going to deal with it? You know what I realized though? They were just as worried about me. Because when we got to know each other, right, and it took a little while, they told me they Googled me and I said, like, what did you find? Because I'm not like Sean and in those days you didn't have that amount of social media. Well, they found that um, I was up for the chairman of OSHA or something like that, and that was it. And because they said they were just as worried about who and I was and how I would deal with them as I was worried about them. So in a way, you know, it showed me that our differences, there are differences, but our similarities are so much more. And, uh, you know, I went very humbly to them and said, yeah, what? I never see a snowblower in my life. Good. Tick. I never see an ice road in my life. Tick. Can you help me? And, you know, they warmed to me and they helped me, you know, tremendously to get to understand what my job really was and how to run the organization in the right way. So, you know, they are good and they are bad. I think what bowled them over was that I came with humility, absolute humility, saying, oh, that's a snowblower, nice, never seen one. <laughs> so, uh, you know, yeah, in that way you get people to help you. Just done? Yep. Lawrence, we can't hear you, you're on mute. Yeah, mute there, Lawrence. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, folks, um, yeah, you all listen to some really, really exciting conversation. Um, uh, I'm sure the viewers are enjoying it quite a bit. Tristan is being a fantastic host. And on that note, I'd like to introduce Tristan's co-host this evening, who is joining in on the call now. Her name is Khalifa. She is 14 years old as well. She's been listening to the conversation and, and she's really been excited by what she's been hearing. And she has some questions for you all as well. So I'll just toss over to Khalifa so that she can continue on with this wonderful discussion. All right, welcome Khalifa. Hi. Hi Khalifa. How are you? We're doing good. Sean and I, we're doing good. Good to enjoy, go. Enjoying the conversation with young people. Um, so, Throughout like your whole career, what was the best experience you ever had throughout your whole career? I'll let Sean go. Ah, okay. Uh, so, so Khalifa, I just want to make sure I, I heard your question right. You, you were saying, out of my entire career, what was the best moment of my career? Yeah. All right. Oh man, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. um, I've had so many really lovely moments you know and uh I, I it's really tough for me to pick one but but i could tell you that it's always been moments around people like uh i really enjoy being around people um if you ask me what i remember from this year you know there's a there's a young lady who works in our in, in our office and, and you know we cook every friday in our office right uh uh, everybody cooks and we have we have lunch you together. Me, you never invited me. Yeah, I, I, and that's on me. That's on me. You have an open invitation. Once COVID is done and we're back in the office, I hope you join us. Um, you know, but she's 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 a young lady, a single single parent, and um, you know, a Tuesday evening she calls me down and she says, you know, Sean, um, uh, come, I, I want you to see something. And and she took me down to the car park and she she opened a, a car door and she said, sit down here. And I said, OK, I said, so whose car is this? She said, no, this is my car. I said, wow, you know, congratulations. And she said, Sean, you know, 
Uh, I just want to thank you because, you know, uh, this job has given me the opportunity to go to the bank and I've been able to get a loan and I've never thought that I would be able to own a car in my life. But, you know, I, you know, I just bought this car. I, this is a brand new car that I bought. And for me, it's one of the things that probably that's the thing that I remember the most about 2020. You know, it was a really special moment for me. Uh, and I always enjoyed, I always enjoy the moments that I spend with my colleagues when somebody has a new baby, when somebody's getting married, you know, I, I feel like we've been able to build a real family in the organization. And uh, the fact that I, I get this chance to do something that I love, and by doing something that I love, I get a chance to impact on people's lives positively, and they get a chance to take care of their families and do things in their communities. You know, I feel like the luckiest person in the world to be able to do what I am doing. So I'm sorry, Khalifa, if I couldn't give you one moment, but it's just, I honest to God enjoy what I do so much and I feel so lucky about having to do it that I just feel like, you know, every day is, 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 a, is, a, is a great day for me. Yep, back to you, Khalifa. Uh, that's amazing thing to see that you are very happy for others when, they are, when something good happens to them. All right, yes, for sure. So, I think um, when I got pushed out of Trinidad into Alaska, everybody laughed at me when I reached there and said, you must have done something really bad for them to send it to Alaska. But that was such a wonderful experience for me. So I landed there in January. It was minus 70. You hear what I said? Minus 70. I came out of a bus where our, the oil field was, is called Prudhoe Bay. It's 250 miles north of the Arctic Circle, okay? North oh, of the Arctic Circle. So you fly to work on a plane, an hour and a half from Anchorage, and then you land in a camp and you stay there for the week and you come back down. So, you know, I landed in January, it was minus 70. You don't see the sun until February, because it's completely dark. You know, the satellites even bend a little bit downwards, imagine that. You know, think about it, you know, the top of the world and the satellites bend like this to be able to pick up the signals. And I came off that bus and completely dark and they said, you know, take this bus to your camp. And I started to cough because I didn't realize that at minus 70, the, the air freezes and it goes down into your lung and it makes you cough. And, you know, I learned so much. I went to work on a plane. I went to work on a hovercraft. I went to work on a boat. I went to work on a helicopter. And I went to work on an ATV. You know what the ATV is? A big one, like a like a like a tank, with you know the you know when the, the different times of the of the of the um, of the of the year. I could go in the hovercraft and it was completely iced. I went on a boat when the ice broke up. I went on a on a helicopter when it was in between. And I went on an ATV when the ice got really really rough and started to freeze up. I mean, it was a, such an amazing place, and I gained an appreciation of people. I gained appreciation on the environment. I know you'll ask me, I'm working in oil and gas, and that's a different story. But I gained appreciation of the environment. I saw everything from polar bears to grizzly bears. I saw a grizzly bear as I was coming on a bus, just stand up in front of a slumberjay um, warehouse, and I'm thinking that slumberjay ban better not come out at this point in time. <laughs> see me a meal, and I'm seeing caribou crossing the slope, thousands of caribou are in there heading across the soap. I've seen like nature, things, industry and nature working together like I've never seen before. It was interesting. I I got, I you know, I felt racism. I've seen that up there too. But then I've seen the goodness of people as well. And I even learned, you know, about, um, you know, I learned about the native people. I even learned the E word, which is a, a bad word. And I bet all of y'all don't know that he would. I had a Native, Native American come up to me and said that I was running the camp, so I was in charge that somebody called him the e -word and I really didn't know what it was. You know what it is, anybody, you know? Eskimo, that's a bad word, like the N word and the C word. Did I know that? No, you have to call people by whatever Native American, if they are Inuit or Athabascan, you cannot call them the e word. So I actually had to like sort out one of those things as well of somebody calling somebody the E word. But it was such an eye-opening experience. It makes you grow. Minus seven day makes you grow. I can tell you that. You know, one morning I got up and all the snow was black because the volcano nearby erupted. I was like, what is this? 
and we had regular earthquakes because that is the Pacific Plate for those who do geology. So duck and cover was a regular for me. But those days I could have duck and cover was young. Imagine me trying to go under the table and come back out now. So it was a, it was an amazing experience and I don't think I'll ever forget it or the people I met or the things I learned. And that for me was uh, one of the best experiences I've had. So you think, so you think Sean, you had to go up and see. Hey, I, I, I've never been to Alaska, but I, you really encouraged me now, you know, I, 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 hopefully soon, hopefully soon. Yeah, I will explain all the places you have to go. Yeah, yeah, and tell me the words not to use. E word, the e word, use the e word, no, no, no. And that's what they teach us in the history books. I was like, um, 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 I was trying to figure out what the e word is, I scratched my head. I said, so yeah. what's that? trying to ask the man, what is the e word? And he don't want to tell me. <laughs> Uh, it yeah, was yeah. rough <laughs> and cool. Oh God, we talk about cool. Mm, Sorry, right. that's, that's cool. Scary, but that's what was my best experience. Yes. Okay, so before we move on to the next question, audience, please feel free to um, leave questions in the Q and A chat. So I don't know if it's Q and A or chat for you, but please feel free if you have questions, leave it in the chat, and we will answer it as fast or best that we can. So next question. Um, so the Heroes Ideas um, Strike Team, which I am a part of, had discussed some ways of promoting energy conservation and efficiency. Knowing that there isn't just one type of energy, I believe is, it is very fascinating and important to today's society and the world, and that it will be used throughout time, of course. But of course, we humans manage it and we are bound to come up with some hurdles. Therefore, my next question to you both is what significant energy challenge or challenges do you see that are potentially forthcoming and how do you suppose that we overcome them together? Yeah, I think I'll give Ali to take that one first. <laughs> <laughs> well, energy challenges. So, I am a scientist, so I do believe in science. I know I've been hearing that on the news, some people don't believe in science. And I believe in global warming and climate change. I don't know if you've ever been to Moruga, but I went there recently and the St. Peter's statue fallen into the sea. Sean, we have to fix that, okay? It fallen into the sea. And I grew up in Mayaro from San Grande, you know, going to holidays there. And I remember I had to walk like a quarter mile to reach the water. Now it's right up. You know, so I believe in that. So in terms of energy challenges, the for us in Trinidad, we produce oil and gas, but the demand for oil and gas is going to fall because we must, you must move to a low carbon future. But we have to sell our oil and gas because that's what the basis of our economy is. So in terms of the price of oil and gas, certainly it is going to fall because the demand is going to fall. We're going to move into more electrification you know, the electric cars, etc. The biggest demand for, for, for oil right now is to make gasoline. And as we go on into Teslas and all of those other things, you will see that falling. The main area that we will need the oil and gas for is for like jet fuel, or maybe for example, the fuel used for, for boats, unless, you know, we go to hydrogen, etc. for those types of fuel. So for us, it's going to be a transition to a low carbon future and uh, we have oil and gas to sell. So it is going to be difficult. Also, we need to conserve. You know, everybody says, you know, how do we conserve, etc. Well, you know, we need to cut our energy consumption. All of us can do this. We need to start to recycle. You know, I'm amazed at how much we don't recycle. You know, I've been offshore in, say, Norway, etc. And they recycle 90% of everything they use. You know, when you go, you have like five bags facing you, one for bottles, one for cans, one for food, one for, I was like 90% and they're extremely rich. Why can't we recycle? You know, we need to do all those things towards a low carbon future. That's the biggest, biggest change, you know, facing us. I know that um, the government signed the Paris Accord and that means we have to reduce our um, carbon emissions by 15%. And we at Heritage, we are trying our best, you know, to make sure that we um, we reduce our emissions, we check all our fugitive emissions, so we are not, you know, putting methane into the air, etc. And also, the government is supposed to go to 20% renewables. So all of those things have to happen within, I think, until 2030 or 2040. So a lot of things to happen, you know, um, and so energy itself 
oil and gas is going to be really challenged in the next few years. Yeah, yeah, and Tristan, just to add to what uh, Aline is saying, you know, you know, after lunch today, after I had lunch with my family, I sat down with my kids and I looked at uh, this show by David Attenborough, Life on Our Planet. You know, Aline and I sit on a, on, a, on the Energy Chamber board together, and one mm -hmm. of our board members actually recommended that we all look at it. And it was it was mind blowing, and it's so it, it's so crazy that I'm coming into this discussion right after looking at it. And I hope everybody who's on the call that they get a chance to to, to look at it. It's on Netflix. David Attenborough, A Life on Our Planet, and it really talks about how the planet has evolved and how the planet has changed, and how fossil fuels and the increase in carbon in the atmosphere has contributed to the decline of you know wild species and the the oceans and coral reefs and everything else. And you know in Trinidad. We, we, we are at this crossroads, right? Oil and gas has, to a large extent, been responsible for the quality of life that we live. And for those of you all who have had the opportunity to travel to other places in the world, especially to other places in the Caribbean, right? Because you could compare Trinidad easily to other places in the Caribbean. You could see that as Trinidadians, we've been very fortunate to live a very high quality of life. And that has been directly attributable to the amount of oil and gas and that wealth we've had in the country. But, you know, I'm, I'm not... A lot of people are saying, oh, you know, that's going to be the end of it. You know, if, if, if because we know the world is moving away from oil and gas, what that means is that Trinidad doesn't have a very bright future. And maybe that to some extent we are going to have challenges. But I'll tell you, the real value in Trinidad is not just the resources that are in the ground. It is the people, the engineers, the scientists, the managers, the leaders who've built good companies, who've run good companies. And I have no doubt that if we have the right leadership in place and that the, con the government continues to emphasize that we go in the right direction, you would also you you'd have those people like Arlene, people like myself, you know, people who've been around for a little bit of a while and then people like yourself, Tristan, coming up and people like yourself, especially who understand technology and they understand that the role that technology is playing because, you know, when people think about energy in the, future, in, the in the past, they think about BP and they think about Exxon and so on. Today, when we think about energy, we think about Tesla, right? We think about Bill Gates and industrial solar, right? So to me, energy and technology, they go, they're going to go hand in hand in the future. So those, co those companies and those countries who do well and who make a fair amount of return on, on, on equity on energy, it's not just going to be because of resources that are in the ground, it's going to be because of the resources in the heads of the people who work for them because you are going to be able to create things a lot of which we probably didn't even think about as yet but i'm i'm convinced that we have a lot of really bright people in this country and uh, there's been some exciting stuff around hydrogen in recent time mm -hmm. with a with a gentleman by the name of philip julian mm -hmm. so i feel tristan that your generation is going to work very hard i, I hope that you're going to work very hard but i'm convinced that you guys are going to do a lot to change our energy landscape in, in in the next few years yes yes and I, I do agree that energy and technology work hand in hand and yes um well the more generations go by well future generations i'm sure that they all increase the earth even better and with more greater technology but before i move on i want to add um my thoughts on this as well and um my problem that i think will be very hard um, as a challenge for energy and that's conserving energy so i think convincing the entire population or society but to partake in energy conservation would be really hard even if we do all kind of things there are still some you know, people who will not care at all but for those who may actually help out we could bring awareness by making short videos, broadcasts, creative portrayals, and even share tips on social media. But not just telling them to conserve it, but give them tips on that, right? Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, not just tell them to conserve it and give them tips, but also let them know the benefits of doing it and the detriment of the latter. However, for those who may still not want to conserve, we could either limit the amount of energy provided to them by the amount of money they pay or make them pay more money based on the amount of energy consumption and their abode. So the more energy they waste, the more money they lose. And of course, money is one thing that most people would want to consume. 
Yeah. No, I, I agree with you 100%, Tristan. And I also think that, you know, you, you, you are 14 years old, right? And this planet belongs to you more than it belongs to me, right? Because I've been here longer. So I think it's also a great opportunity for young people like yourself. Imagine if we could get all the secondary school students across the country to really drive that and then take that into their homes. Because a lot of times you have a, you have influence on your parents. And if you say, hey, listen, take off the AC tonight, take off this light when you leave from your room. So I, I think it's also a great opportunity for the young people of the country to really step up there and make a huge difference. I think, you know, a lot of times young people think about what their voice can do. Like this whole idea around energy conservation is something that young people can drive. And I don't think that you should should, should wait for, for, for the older folks to do it. I think it's something that you guys should take the lead on as well. Definitely. So, so I think not only energy conservation, but certain um, certainly reducing our carbon footprint. I think yeah, that's something yes. that you guys can really take a, a lead on. Planting trees, energy conservation is part of that, reducing water wastage, all of those things, Tristan. I mean, even for example, not eating as much meat or anything yep. like that, because you know, you know that the cows, etc., contribute to a certain amount of um, methane emissions and stuff. So all of those things that we can all do together. But if as Sean says, right, I mean, we are the older ones. You guys, this world is now yours. So you guys have to step up and take hold of it and do what is necessary. It's now yours and it's now Khalifa's own. And I want to reiter reiterate something that Sean said, you know, the resources above the ground, that's you, Khalifa, and the rest of people are so much more important than the ones below the ground. So always remember that the resources above the ground are much more important than those below the ground, just like Sean just said. So um, I see we have some questions coming in from the comments. Um, I'll, I'll just take this time to ask them now. There's just about two. So um, what is the worst experience you've ever had in your entire career? Worst. Uh, let me see. Uh, I, I, I'll go first with that. And I, I know um, Ali spoke a little bit about it, you know. And energy to a large extent, especially when you start dealing on the global energy side, it is very, uh, it's very white, very, very white driven. So, I mean, I've had instances of overt racism uh, at, at different interactions with people, uh, especially when you have meetings in Houston and so on. Uh, I would say to you, that's, that, that, that to me is probably some of the worst that I, I, I've had to come across. But I would also say to you as well that I, I found so much nicer people and so much good people of all ethnicities that, you know, it, it, it's also, I also see it as a great opportunity that I've had in my career to meet those type of people. But yes, I've seen a fair amount of overt racism within our sector and uh, it's something that that's definitely disheartening. Yeah. You know, for me, um, my role was a bit different from uh, Sean's. So my main role, because it's a high hazard industry, has to, was to prevent people from getting killed or hurt. And my worst experiences um, are those kind of experiences when I've had to, um, to go comfort a family with a fatality or comfort a family when there has been a serious injury of, um, of one of their family members. You know, our motto on safety is very important, uh, that it's a value that we hold. And it's about keeping the hydrocarbon in the pipe where it belongs. And when that sometimes that doesn't happen in the right way, we have these serious incidents. And I have been, you know, to be the bearer of bad news quite a few times. And those times are some of the worst times in my career. All right, um, we have just one more question from the comments, I believe. Okay, so do you have any plans? Do, does your company have any plans um, for involving your community in promote, um, for involving your community in promoting and participating in recycling or energy conservation? 
So um, we have a corporate social responsibility program where we focus on our fence line communities, whether the communities in Point Fortin, in La Brea, Superior area in Santa Flora, Palaseco, Guaya. But we weren't looking at energy conservation at this time, but we do have other programs. We have something that we're going to launch very soon called the Hero, where we're going to take um, a young student from the best in a few schools in the SEA and sponsor them all the way through university. In that way, you know, we feel that, you know, we are getting, you know, making it sustainable that these, these children can give back to their communities when they come through the whole university system. We're going to give them internships. We're going to you know, have them as graduate trainees. We're going to develop the wholeness of the person. That's what we want to do. And the other thing that we want to do, not so much energy conservation, is look at the land holdings that we have and see how best that we can support the, um, the government's plan in terms of going forward with agriculture, etc. And, you know, we have some other programs as well, you know, but we haven't looked at we have looked at recycling. We had a program to um, to help communities clean up their areas and start a recycling program. We put that a bit on the back burner with COVID, and what we did essentially instead was, uh, you know, feed a lot of needy families. So we did have something like that, Tristan. I'm still thinking over right now, you know, what is the focus after COVID and how best to make our community um, social responsibility program the best for what is happening at this point in time in our economy. Okay. Yeah, and uh, just to add to what Alina is saying there, Tristan, uh, so one of the things that we did on the recycling is that, well, you know, I, I believe that you have to, st to look at your, your internal self as well. So uh, internally, we started an, a, a pr pretty decent recycling program and we worked with a uh, I forgot the name of the government ministry now, but they, 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 you, you work with them and they bring pickup bins in your community. Mm -hmm. So we brought one of those bins in. Uh, and so that area right around us, we extended that to, 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 to those communities so that they could use that cycling bin. And we've been able to sort things like paper, plastics and that sort of stuff. When it comes to CSR generally, you know, we, we, we do have quite an extensive CSR program. And for those of you, uh, for hopefully some of you guys will follow us, like I said, on social media, and you'll see a lot of what we're doing. A lot of what we're focused on are on primary schools and introducing technology. So we do things like uh, we've just, we started a program introducing robotics and coding to standard fours and standard fives. One of our big things was to do it after SEA. Um, so we did it last year with the, with the standard five class when they finished SEA, and then we were going to do it again with the standard five class this year. And of course, COVID-19 changed a lot of that. Um, COVID, COVID has changed a lot, you know, so so a lot of the programs that we had earmarked for this year, we no longer are, are, are able to execute them. Um, you know, we, we, we usually have a, a Christmas treat for a number of, uh, uh, you know, uh, homes and less fortunate families in our area. And we have like a thousand kids come in and we do. But w what we are focusing now is what we've realized is that there are a number of uh, kids in the communities who don't have access to devices. So we have a big device drive going on and we work in a number of our customers and partners to provide devices to a number of schools in our communities. Uh, that's ongoing and that will continue for the next few months. Actually, I would say to you probably about 80% of our CSR budget has now been redirected to that program. So we hope to provide a few hundred devices to schools in our communities over the next few months. Yeah, we're doing that too. We gave 100 already to the Ministry of Education and we have another maybe 200 to go. So we've been making sure that, you know, children can get online and and um, and keep up with all the work that they have to do online as necessary. Yeah, good. And uh, Ali, I mean, I know you and I haven't spoken about it as yet, but what we did is extend to our customers and you, if you buy devices from the US, you know, once mm -hmm. you buy it, we will ship it in and deliver it to you for free. So we right. work with you. So, so that way, it, you know, we could get a few extra devices and so you don't have to pay shipping costs and so on. All right, well, thank you for that. We think about it for All sure. Right. Yeah, that's nice. But um, now we'll hand over to Kalipa to continue and come. So, Miss Ali and Mr. Sean, let's change things up a little bit. Thank you. The, who makes, what makes a hero to you? 
I guess for me, a hero is someone who does something over and above the normal to help people with little thought for themselves. I think selfless given for the greater good. That's what a hero does. Selfless given for the greater good, not Captain America or Spider-Man, but selfless given for the greater good. That kind of person for me is a hero. Yeah, I, I think Arlene hit it on the head there. I mean, to me, when I think about a hero, it's, it's people who do right, even in the face of all these challenges. Like, I feel like like, like nowadays, it's so easy to, to get short-term benefit from doing the wrong thing. But heroes are the people who stick to it and they do the right thing because doing the right thing is the right thing to do. And by doing that, they, they, they build long-term... They, 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 they do... They, they focus on bringing more benefit to the communities, their families, their countries, and so on. You know, it's people who are not willing to take short term mm -hmm. uh, gains just for themselves and so on. Yeah. Khalifa, uh, yes. Awesome. So I have a next question. Who is one of your heroes? Like, who is your hero to you? Yeah. So I could start, you know, it's a cliche to say your mother and your father is a hero. So I'll have to use the cliche. My mother and my father is a hero. I don't know if you could see my earring. I wore it just for you guys. It actually is an abacus. You know, those are the old Chinese things that they do the multiplication, division, all these sums with, you know. So my dad came from China at 12. He didn't speak any English. He had no education whatsoever. And my mom is from Rio Claro. She lived in a barracks in a cocoa estate um, where she was picking cocoa, etc. And um, and they got married and they had eight children. I am the eight of the eight. And through their sacrifice, you know, we were all able, all seven of us have our masters to go to school. And, uh, you know, she they believed, you know, because of what they have come through with no education, that the best way out of poverty was to learn. So my mom used to say, learn your lesson. That is what it was. And she instilled that in us and the certain values that have sustained me, you know, in my entire life, not only working life, but in my personal life. And those are respect. You know, she never got that as a person living in a barracks. Integrity, making sure your word is your bond and creating trust with people. Um, she, it was hard work. I mean, there was nothing easy working on a cocoa estate or my father who was from China, who also working on a cocoa estate. And the last one was performance or delivery. Do what you say, you will do. And um, because of those things and the hard work that they had, so I didn't grow up middle class. By the time I reached on, my, things were easier, but my sisters, all of them who are lawyers or principals, they live in a tapia house for most of their life. And uh, they lived, uh, you know, I don't think we thought about being poor in those days. You just, you know, did what you had to do. But, you know, they worked from nothing to put all of us through school and to inculcate the values that have made all of us successful. You know, I remember, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, but every time we had to go to a university, my father would sell a piece of land. Honestly, he used to buy a lot of land. I remember going down the Valencia stretch just before I went to university for him to sell the land to send him to university. So, you know, I know it's cliche, but, you know, they gave us a start and they came from nothing and inculcated us with the values that would make us successful. So that's why they are my heroes. Yeah, so Khalifa, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm going to also be as cliche as Arlene, correct? Because uh, I'll tell you that my actually I was telling Arlene a story just before we started. You know, my parents are my heroes as well. You know, I'm we, we are we 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 are from Kunupia. My dad grew up in Kunupia. Uh, he was the first in his family to go to a secondary school. Um, you know, uh, and he's he's always wanted to go to university. And he never could afford to go to university. And I remember when I was probably about eight or nine years old um, and we would, we, we would go for a drive on a, a Sunday evening. He would take us, he would drive us down and we would look at Presentation College and um, and he would say, you know, hopefully one, he said one day you'll, go, you'll come to school here. And uh, and I did, I, I, I ended up going to Presentation College and I, I remember us driving through UWI St. Augustine campus and he'd say, hey, one day you're going to come to school here as well, right? 
And it was always something that, that he never had a chance to do in his life because yeah. he was he always had to work and take care of his family and so on. He's he's one of two brothers and he has five sisters and his dad died when he was very young, probably about 17 years old. So he was always there taking care of his family. Um, and you know, even though we grew up like that, you, you know, my, my dad, uh, Ali, Ali says you never think about being poor or rich. Like, I, you know, I always grew up, you know, feeling like, you know, I was, it, I never had to worry about anything. My peer, I always felt like my parents always tried to provide for us and what they couldn't provide materially. There was so much love. I always remember us every Friday evening we would come home, you know, I, I don't know what these people like, but like, oh, I know you KFC, but I remember it when I was growing up, uh, KFC was like, you know, you, you would have KFC once every three months or once every six months, you know, it was like a treat, but you would come home on a Friday evening and we would cook together. Um, we would fry wontons together. My, 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 my mom always really kept us together as a family. And um, today we, we still live in Kunupia, you know, we all, we live in one compound, everybody has a house, but we, we, we are a very, we are much extended family today, but we are still a very, very close family. And I know how, how proud my dad was to bring the business back to Kunupia. You know, he, we had our office in Port Spain for a long time. And today, you know, we, we have about 200 people working in Kunupia, head, head, headquartered in Kunupia, but headquartered for an operation that is operating in Miami, Houston, and different places around the world. And I know my dad takes a great sense of pride in being able to bring it back to Kunupia. And that to me is, is a lot. I, I, I look up to my parents a lot for that, and they really are my heroes as well. You know, when um, the new agricultural thing is eat what they grow, I thought that was how people used to normally live, you know, because Grandpa <laughs> Santa Grande, you yeah. know, first of all, my dad used to cook all the time because he, did, he, he thought I would really like Chinese food for some reason, okay? So <laughs> in the evening when I come home from school or something, he would say, go pick something to cook. So I would go in the, in the garden and I would pick melanjan or murai or mustard or pak choy or Karali, I would take my licks for, I couldn't handle that one. <laughs> I would, you know, and we ate what we grew. So it was yeah. like, it was just like that was life at those times that these young people don't know anything about. That was how life was. But yeah. it was a happy life and a, a family life, you know. And it's, 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 coming, yeah. it's coming back now, thankfully it's coming back, you know, like uh, like we have been eat, we have been eating um jingi for the last three, yeah. three weeks, right? Because our jingi plants. Are... Jingi, they'll watch me funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what we have growing in our garden now, and that's what we're eating a lot Christian, of. You know what jingi is? Chris Tristan, you know what jingi is? Well, it tastes really good. <laughs> yeah, 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 it tastes very good. I had it for lunch today. <laughs> yeah, so. It's a kind of squash with a sort of rough skin that uh, my dad used to cook it with egg in the Chinese way. Oh, really? And with, yeah, and with rice noodles, we call funsi and oh. egg and jingi. It's very good. Oh, I, I got to look up that recipe it, online. I know it's right. I can't cook it. I know the theory. <laughs> yeah, but, you know. Very good. All right. Khalifa, back to you. Yeah. Give us a harder question. <laughs> Uh -huh. Well, that's interesting. People are right now. Yeah, so I have one more question from the comments to ask, and it's what is your biggest achievement in your career? Ooh. You go, yeah, Sean, I had to think about that. Yeah, I think uh, if, I, if, if I were to think about my biggest achievement professionally, it, it was really taking the company to a different country. So we've been operating in Trinidad for a long time, up to around 2014. And, um, you know, our board had sat down and we had done some analysis and we, we had the, the, the thoughts at that time was that the Trinidad economy would face a few uh, hurdles. And if we wanted to continue growing the business at the rate we wanted to continue to grow it, we would have to take the business overseas. But taking a business overseas is is quite challenging. But our first overseas operation was actually in Haiti, right? Uh, yeah. Why we went to Haiti? Yes, why we went to Haiti? Yeah, boy, when, why you went to Haiti? When we did our analysis, and, and this is important, I think, for Trinidadian companies, um, we, we looked at countries where there was high pot potential for GDP growth. So meaning that the economies of those countries would grow. And quite a few countries came up. 
But then when, a when everybody knows that a country has high GDP growth potential, then they tend to invest in that company, uh, in that country. And in our business, international logistics, you have a, a number of large global players, right? Like DHLs and so on. So it's very difficult to compete head to, the, head, to head with them in a new country. So what we said is that we were going to look at countries where there was a high GDP growth potential, but also mixed in with a high risk of doing business. Because what, what, in those countries where there's a high risk of doing business, it tends to keep the big global multinationals out a little bit more. And Haiti, well, man, there's few places in the Western Hemisphere that are as risky to do business as Haiti is. But you know what we said? We said, you know what? We, we built our business in Trinidad. And, you know, to some people, Trinidad is a high risk country as well. But we felt like we understood how to do business and we, we, we knew how to manage that risk. And we had good support from different agencies in Trinidad. So we went and we opened our business in Haiti. And the nice thing about a country doing business in a country like Haiti is because there's very little competition, the profit margins you have on the business or the products and the services that you deliver are a little bit higher than they are in a place like Trinidad, where you have more competition. So we did fairly well in Haiti. Uh, we sold off our Haiti business uh, because we then decided to focus on our Guyana business. And for any of you, any of you all who are following anything with energy sector you know that guyana is like the gem of the energy world today right so we, we today we we have almost 300 people working for us in guyana uh, and that business has really taken off so it was a combination of maybe strategy luck being in the right place at the right time and having a really good team but it all came together really really well for us in guyana um and that led to businesses opening in suriname houston Mexico and uh, next month we are opening in Bogota, Colombia. So taking the business international has been really the highlight of my career. I have to say that's really impressive, Sean. As I said, uh, you guys you, have got so glory. That looks like your mantra there. <laughs> I could never have the guts to do what you're doing. So I really admire that. You know, I think the highlights of my career is um, every time I see someone who I've mentored pass me in terms of their career. Like I have mentored quite a few people over the course of my career. And uh, even as I retired, they would write me and say, I am now the, the vice president going to Azerbaijan, you know, as a subsurface person, especially the Trinidadians. When that happens, I feel that, you know, I was given and I have given back to the point that I have developed, you know, Trinidadians to be able to go out there and to compete globally. And there are quite a few, and I am so absolutely proud of them. And I think that is what makes me feel, you know, I actually did something good in terms of my career because I have brought some young people through to the pinnacle of, of their profession. So those are the highlights of my career. All right. No, but uh, but but Alina, I, 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 I know you say about uh, but, but, but my guts and glory, yeah? but uh, for me, like I feel proud sitting down here. I didn't, I didn't realize you ran Prudhoe Bay. I mean, uh, I, I didn't. I, 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 I know about your stint in London, but for you to have, for, 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 yeah. for, for someone from Trinidad and a woman of color from Trinidad to have done that, that's, you know, and I hope that all the, all the other people, I mean, Prudhoe Bay was, 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 you know, be, one biggest, of these, big, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was, was it the biggest? Yeah, it was wow. one of the biggest. He used to create uh, 500,000 barrels a day down the Trans-Alaskan pipeline. Wow. Yeah. Wow. But, yeah. you know, um, it was weird when I went to, to Prudhoe Bay, all the black people used to wave me and I'm thinking, I know that person. But apparently when you see one black person, you wave. <laughs> I didn't know that was how you used to do it. I was like, I'm not sure I know him. He waved at me, so I'm waving back and I'm thinking, who is that? Yeah, and so yeah, yeah. afterwards I realized because you just see one or two and I actually met two Trinidadians out there and both both of them were cooks you know okay. um and one was in Endicott and one was in Prudhoe and every time I reach and they know I'm reaching you know they will say okay we're cooking something special for you I was thinking, <laughs> what would a Trinidadian doing up in the middle of Prudhoe Bay I mean I get sent you know what I mean but they had, they had Trinidadians up there really yeah. and true it's like, yeah. and it's, it's every time you travel and you hear a Trinidadian accent, they be like, what? Another Trini, a Trini, and you go, hey, hey, how are you going? Everything all right? 150 miles north of the Arctic Circle in minus 70. 
Yeah. They had to train that ends up there. I was like, okay, but guys, you know, all right. Yeah, yeah. I can come here on my own. I get sent up up here. <laughs> so, yeah. Very good. Very good. Tristan, back to you, brother. Yep. All right. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, so, I guess we only have one last question. That's it. All right. So, um, You've taken your road to energy, right? And have gone through all the ups and downs of getting to where you are now, right? But as most of us in this session are young and more or less interested in energy, do you have any advice that you could give us which may help us in our future paths to where we ought to go? Yeah, I could uh, I could take a shot at that, Tristan. Uh, you know, I think if, if I were 13 or 14 years old again, um, and, and I'm assuming that a lot of people are, uh, who, who would have logged on? You know, I, I, I wouldn't be so concerned about energy or non-energy or anything else. You know, what, what, I, what I would suggest to you guys is to be the best you could be and learn as much as you could and to be humble about learning. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you know, Tristan, we, uh, we were very fortunate about two years ago to start a research and development department and it's all driven by digital technologies, right? Tons of coding and nowadays, nowadays Arlene, it's, it's all Python programming. Yeah, no longer. Just um, me, Chris, just yeah, yeah. I can't. I used to program, but I can't. Remember, I didn't know Python at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I used to use Basic and, and uh, Pascal, right, back in the day. C, but C++. <laughs> yeah, but but nowadays there's so much opportunity around technology, and I think that the biggest impact to the energy sector will be the impact from technology. But I also think that the biggest impact to our lives will be from technology. Exactly. And I would I would say to you, Tristan, that as a young person sitting in a little Caribbean yeah. island, I, I always tell people, you know, 20 years ago, if you were born in Trinidad or if you were doing a business in Trinidad, you had a geographical disadvantage compared to somebody who was doing something similar in Europe or North America. They had access to a size of a market that was bigger than you. They had support services that were better than you. But now with the internet and with technology, you could sit down in Trinidad and provide services to, to American customers and consumers, Europeans, to different people. In fact, I could tell you right now, uh, in Trinidad, our head office in Trinidad is providing a ton of services to all our offices around the world, including our offices in Houston and in, uh, and in Miami. In fact, one of the things that makes us as good as we are and as competitive as we are is our ability to use Trinbagonians to provide services to our offices in the US. And Aline will tell you, coming from the energy sector, it has always been the opposite way around, meaning that we in Trinidad and, and we down here in the Caribbean have actually been the consumers of the technology that has been developed in the US and we just utilize those. So head office would, would, would be in the US, would be in, in Europe, and they would send services and provide things on for us in Trinidad. But I, I really am very proud of the fact that we now have a ton of young people who are developing digital technologies, supporting energy and non-energy companies. Um, but I feel that the future is bright. I really feel that the future is bright. And if I was a young person, I would learn everything I could learn exactly. about digital technologies, about coding, about development, about AI, about uh, 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 blockchain, right? I mean, we have a project going on right now with blockchain and, blockchain and supply chain, right? So there's so much to learn. And the other thing I would also seriously consider is what my educational part would be. I asked myself, you know, I, I have a, my first degree is industrial engineering uh, and then I went to, to do an MB. But would I go down that path again? When I look at the amount of online learning resources available, you know, um, it's crazy. You know, every every Thursday night, Tristan, we have what we call a sip and learn, right? Our R&D department, uh, everybody, we the, the company sends dinner. Well, these days it sends dinner to their house and we all sit logging around 8.30 and, and between 8.30 and 9.30, two times to the month, we, all we are doing is discussing the impact of new technologies on our business and the energy sector, both on, as a supply chain and the energy sector. And it's so crazy the amount of things that I'm learning. Like, I feel like I've learned more in the last six months than I did in my entire three years at UE and my entire two years at my MBA. It's, it's crazy. So I would say to you guys, don't wait to be able to give somebody, to give you something to consume it. Go on the internet and find out where the resources are. And a lot of the time, the resources are free or close to free, 
right? And make sure you're learning as much as you can about everything that's going on. Digital technologies, coding, AI, blockchain, you know, learn, learn, learn as much as you can about that. Yep, that's it for yep. me. So I'm Take very sensitive. Yep. I mean, keep loving to learn. That's what I would say. Keep loving to learn. Um, learn everything that you can. I mean, knowledge is power and that could never be taken away from you. I mean, this we are in the fourth industrial revolution, which is robotics and AI. Don't let it leave you behind. You know, when I was coming through, I decided I had to go and do my um, my diploma in computer science because it was leaving me behind. Don't let it leave you behind. Trinidadians have to learn that they have the ability that they can do the moonshot like anybody else, as Sean said. In the men, in my time, and in, you know, we were in this little island and we were kind of confined here. The world is now your oyster. The modern yes. world is made for you, young people at fourteen years and old. Go. Do what you love doing, eh? because when you do something you love, it won't feel like work. You know, it yeah, will just yeah. be something you love. Keep on doing what you love and, you know, and follow your dreams. You know, I didn't have a dream really coming out from Sunny Grandy. I knew I had to go to work and then I had to get married and then I had to mind my children and that's it. But you guys are, you know, you are, you know, the whole world is open to you. You can see everything online. If you have a dream, follow your dream, do your thing you love. And I, I have one poem that I want to share with you before we go, and it's from Langston Hughes, and he's a, a very um, a very popular Black American poet, and I always like this, and I share it with my children. It says, and I'm not a good poet like Lawrence, okay, so you have to forgive me, I'm a scientist. It says, hold fast to dreams, because if dreams die, life, is but a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, because if dreams go, life is a barren field covered with snow. And I think about that all the time for you young people. Hold fast to your dream. Lovely. If I do it out of Grandy, you guys could do it too. Lovely. You like that one, Sean? I love it. I love it. <laughs> it hold fast the dreams. I, I like that one. A barren field full of snow. I love that. Covered with snow. Covered with snow. Covered with snow. Langston Hughes. I'm going to look it up. Okay. Let's see if I'm right. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, so, I love. I love. I love poetry as well, Ali. My 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 favorite is Invictus, right? So so I'm okay. going to add that one into my list. Yeah, I love that one because it it tells me you know what young people have ahead of them and what they can do and. The fact that you could never give up. If if you get, you know, a wall comes in front of you, go up, go down, go around. Don't let it stop you guys. Don't let it stop you. Because you guys are the future and you guys have to clean up the mess that me and Sean left behind. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that advice. That was really, really amazing. Um, and I'm sure everyone listening will heed it and because I will. Um, I thank you all. I thank you guys for coming here today and sharing all this information with us. And um, Philippe, do you have anything to say? Talk to you guys. I think we lost Khalifa a little bit there. Yeah, I think. Well, Khalifa, I think, yeah. Khalifa, Khalifa lost there. Let's try to get you yeah. back in. Khalifa, okay, cool, Khalifa. Let's get you again. We lost you. Sorry. Thank you. Just awesome opportunity to talk to you guys and find out, you know, how you guys reach to where you are, you know? Yeah. Grab the world, guys. Shake it. And, you know, Take it by its neck, as they say. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There's there, there's no other time that is as great as this time to be young and bright. Like seriously, I mean, the whole world is in front of you guys, and I just That's want you all to understand that 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 the borders of Trinidad do not contain you. Like lit, like the entire world is available and open to you because mm -hmm. of digital. So I just, I, I just. I mean, as much as you're studying maths and chemistry and biology and, 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 and Spanish and so on, fine, go ahead and do that. 
right? But but really invest your time in understanding how digital technologies impact you and how you can make your life around that, right? That really is going to drive the future. So I we really am fought yeah. industrial revolution and where the world is going. And in Correct. that way, guide your career in the right way and your learning more than your career, your lifelong learning. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I always remember when I was at presentation college, you know, a lot of the discussion would have been around, you know, really cool. Everything was around sports and girls and, you know, all those different things. But I would <laughs> I, I would say to you guys as well, you know, spend, spend a little bit of your time around people who are constructive and who you could have good discussions with. I know, I know Tristan, Khalifa, I, I, I know we didn't get a chance to chat beforehand. But I know Tristan, you told me that you were really involved in, in interested in technology and you're a technology enthusiast. You know, how do you get together with three or four other people like that and start thinking about things, creating solutions, holding your mind around de de developing products that people might be able to use one day? You know, and if you spend some of your time constructively doing those things, you'll be amazed to see the kind of things that you could create. You know, so. Make sure you focus your mind, keep good company around you and make sure you're developing cool stuff all the time. Yeah. And remember, whatever you post on the Internet, right? It never goes away. So yeah. think the behavior you have offline before you put it online. I always tell people that. OK. All right. Thank Great. you, guys. I think um, Sean and Arlene, thank you so very much for giving off your time and your and yourselves and your experiences here this evening with us. Um, Tristan, Khalifa, fantastic job being host this evening. Uh, Sean, Ali, this is the first time that, that, that Tristan or Khalifa um, are doing something like this. So um, thank you very much for, for for being their guests in this session. Um, to it's, 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 my, it's my pleasure, Lawrence, and I just want to say, you know, when I was 14 years old, I guarantee I would not have been able to do anything yeah. close to the job that they did. So congrats, I guys. Do. You all did a I wonderful job. I'll be sweating, I'll be sweating, I'll be like, oh, so you guys, <laughs> it gets easier as you do it more and more. So just do yes. it again and do it again and it'll just come naturally. You see how to, um, Sean and I could just talk about everything all the time. So. <laughs> yes, it, be, it becomes better after a while. Yep, yep, yep. Perfect. Thank you all again so very much. Again, for everyone viewing, this is the first of an eight week series on energy, um, Heroes of Energy League Learning Series, where we bring you energy experts and professionals who want to share their learnings and their experiences with the youth of Trinidad and Tobago. Again, thank you very much, Arlene and Sean. Thank you, Tristan and Khalifa. Look out for the Heroes of Energy Efficiency and Conservation campaign that is going to be launched this week on the Heroes Foundation social media page. Um, the young people in Trinidad and Tobago are very much concerned about our energy future. They are very much interested and, and believe that we need to do more in energy conservation and energy efficiency. And our Heroes youth are going to be sharing their views and sharing tips on how to build a greener, cleaner, energy future for Trinidad and Tobago. So thank you again, everyone, and have a fantastic evening. Thank you, guys. Take care. Everybody I stay safe. All the best. Bye-bye. Go get them.